Back in the 60s, it had a tremendous effect on me. I squatted 410, I was 14 years old, Olympic style, with a 260 clean jerk in the contest, hey, 140 pounds. Uh, at 18 years, I could squat 410, hadn't gone anywhere. You know, I played baseball at the time, but I also worked a lot, but it went nowhere. So then I immediately got drafted into the army uh, right out of high school. And I'm in Berlin, Germany, and I go down to the, um, you know, the store, and they got a magazine called Muscle Power Builder. So I pick it up, there's a website, Barbell article in there about training, and it says box squats. So I read it, I go, well, I got nothing to lose. I mean, I squatted 410 for four years and, uh, and got bigger. I was about 155 pounds, you know. So I said, well, I'll give it a shot. So I box squatted three months, like they said, and I took a full squat, I did 450. I mean, this is a dream come true. Uh, six months later, I'm squatting over 500. Then I end up doing the 630 squat and the 181s with zero gear, 1973, you're not allowed to wear a wrist strap, no power belts, no gear, period. And um, with, along with the 670 deadlift, and the box squats really contributed to my, my deadlift. But uh, Culver City Barbell, Bill Peanuts West, George Friend, Pat Casey, Joe DeMarco, all these people, uh, Ovenhauser, they, they were my training partners. I didn't have training partners at all. Uh, but they were my training partners. They had a, a, just a tremendous influence. Um, uh, you know, um, they also talked about how to train the deadlift because all I would do was deadlift, and my deadlift went nowhere either. They're doing rack pulls. They're standing on boxes. They're doing power cleans, and they're doing back extensions. So I said, well, what the hell? I got to do this. So I started following everything they did, and that's in the very early in my career. I mean, I had the top total in the world, uh, the 70 Two worlds were won. The 72 worlds were won by 1635. A few months later, I did 1655 in the meet. And uh, it was everything uh, to me. And so it was, it was a marvel to this day. You go down to my gym, there's pictures of Bill, Bill West and George Friend and Pat Casey in my gym to this day. And uh, I honor these people because they were everything to me. When you first got that magazine, what was it in there that stood out? Was it the content or is the images like how, what made you be able to go, okay, I can understand this. And then how did that influence how you wrote to the general public? Well, basically there was pictures, of course, there's a nice magazine, bodybuilding, powerlifting and, and health and everything. And so it showed them how to box a lot and it talked about how they would set on the box, release and come up. I go, well, hell, I got to give this a shot. And uh, that, so that's what did it. I mean, actually just looking at these tremendously powerful men was a, was a motivation to me. And uh, because I come from Olympic weightlifting and the guys here in America look like crap. These guys are jacked. I mean, Casey's bench is 617, you know, with no, you know, no shirt but back in 1970, 69. And doing 220-pound dumbbells and all this stuff, I'm going, what the hell? Yeah. Uh, George Friend squatted 854 in gym trunks and pulled an 816 deadlift in 242s. These are marvelously strong people, and that's what influenced me. It gave me a desire to be like them someday. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and also, I always wanted to have a club like that. Mm -hmm. And then, actually, see, when Peanuts died and everyone died, I, uh, in 1987, I actually uh, trademarked the name Westside Barbell at that point. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was in business in 1984. Um, as far as a corporation yeah but then i started that in 19 but but what's that barbell was everything a friend of mine roger eastap uh, they used to say roger was the best built power lift in the world well i could kick roger's ass and he was a 98 yeah he's told about 1600 i was beating him in one day ones roger disappears and he comes back like maybe six eight months later he tells 1800 so roger what the hell how what you been doing so i went to what's that barbell in culver city california because I could never get off work. I just could not get off work. So I asked him what he did. He, he basically did everything that I was doing. I was reading a magazine just following what they did. And that's what Roger did. And I, I was sold. I mean, I'm going, how does a guy go for, you know, there's no gear. There's no gear. Two hour win. You know, you're a 98 back in, not a 230 pound 198. And Roger jumped 200 pounds in basically eight or nine months, just like I made, made sensational progress as well. And I was sold with Westside Barbell. Today, I'm indebted to him to the day I die. Mm -hmm. Then progressing from reading the magazines, mm -hmm. getting back home, when you first started training, what equipment did you have? Okay, when I got back, the first thing I built was a power rack. I had no training partner. You built it? I built it. 
I welded it up myself. Okay. Yeah, I could weld, mm -hmm. and uh, I was always in construction. So I had a power rack, and um, it was two-inch holes mm -hmm. way back then, 19, 1970. And uh, that way I could take all my weights out. I didn't need a training partner. It was my, it was my safety, you know. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of pin presses in the bench, a lot of pin presses. I, I, I box squat on four levels, a 17, a 15, a 13, which I trained on, and then at 11. A milk crate is what it was. All right, so I used all these different level box squats back then, four levels. Um, I did lots of rack pulls in two or three different poles, and a lot of presses off pins. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I benched all, all my benching was almost primarily on pins. And I was not a good bencher, but I touched and go for 450 to 175 pounds. I'm not built to bench, but those rack benches <laughs> did it. The heavy lockouts and off my chest with the pauses and uh, overcoming the barbell every time instead of, you know, touch and go or bouncing off your chest. And it made me very, very strong. And that's, um, so that's how I started. I had a power rack. I had a hyper extension bench, not a reverse hyper. I hadn't came up with that yet. I did heavy back raises, 135 pounds. That's all I could get up on my shoulders by myself. And, uh, but I pulled 670 deadlift into me at that time, easy. And uh, I had, um, I think I had some dumbbells, a barbell, and that was it. I, I, I bought a set off your barbell called Hercules 555. It's 555 pounds of weight. Small hole, not Olympic style, uh, you know, for a seven-foot bar. And that was the cheapest thing I could get, you know, so that's what I had. Then I started adding weights to it. But pretty much that's, that's what I had. I, I, you know, I didn't have a lap machine. I never had a Oh, I did rows. I did deadlifts. That's what I did, you know. So, um, and just box squat and bench. So even with minimal equipment, you're still able to obtain maximum results from? I was national record squat in 1971. 2002, I was second in the world in the squat. Yeah. So it's pretty much, you know, I mean, I, I evolved into another program, but nevertheless, basics are basics. If you don't have basics, you have nothing. Uh, like we've talked about before, a pyramid is only as tall as its base. You got a little base, you're not going to go anywhere. I was a very determined person with no training partner for six years. So for those six years, where was that? Was that in your basement of your house or where? Uh, I started training um Yes, I trained at, base, at that time because before I went in the Army, I trained in my mother's basement. Mm -hmm. Got out, of course, as soon as I got out of the Army, I moved away. Um, but I trained in my basement uh, for the whole time and then I, until I did start to get a training partner. Then yeah. to bring that on, who was your first training partner? Well, you know, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I mean, Doug Heath, uh, Jimmy Seicher, they both claimed they were there first. I don't know. And because uh, my memory was not that good. But, you know, Doug was a 114, but he was strong. And Jimmy was a, you know, a, just a puny ass bodybuilder, 140 pounds. I think he could squat 275. But it's better than nothing. At least that's somebody to talk to. I would train with a mirror and an AM radio. That's all I had. I would go down and I'd look at that radio and I was like, you know, that's all I need. I didn't need nobody else. I didn't think you needed. Everybody said, I don't need a training partner. Well, I didn't think I needed one either until I had training partners. Two minds are better than one. Then, um, because I was pretty well known back in the early 70s, and Ohio State's 10 minutes away, a lot of guys would come to Ohio State, of course, and go to school. Uh, Gary Sanger, he saw me. Gary actually became the top 98 in the world in 1984. But this is back in the 70s. He came early in 75, 76. Mm -hmm. Tom Pellucci, uh, Bill Whitaker, um, you know, uh, Tim Gallagher, all these guys showed up, and they were my training partners. And, uh, and actually, the same group in my garage, we were national team champions in 1980 out of my garage. So, um, you know, and that, this is even before Matt Dimmel showed up. So just to give you an idea. And was it because you were training in other locations as well as your house that people found you or was it through magazines? Or how did you all find each other and come to Well, they found together? me because of powerlifting news, which everyone knows what powerlifting USA is. Mm -hmm. Before that, Dan DeWitt had powerlifting news. So they found out, and then there would also be uh, short, short newsletters. Mm -hmm. But they knew I was in Columbus, and when they come to Ohio State, 10 minutes from where I lived, that's how they found me. What was the biggest influence off the bat of having training partners that you're like, damn, I was missing out? What was the biggest thing? Was it the thought process, or was it having spotters or motivation? Kicking someone's ass. You got to be an ass kicker. If you go in the gym, you want to beat nobody. Don't even power lift. Yeah. Just go to Curves or Twenty Four Hour Fitness, you know, or a few other gyms on the West Coast. <laughs> you have a very unique way of when uh, kicking people's ass because if you beat somebody or they beat you, how did you? How did that affect you? So just say if you have a training partner that's better than you, how did that? How did that spur you on? Oh, I hate them. 
<laughs> I walked in the gym. I hated everybody. When I walked through the door, I've always told people it's the truth. Louis Simp has never walked in the gym. When I took one step through, I became somebody else. When you were pulling my briefs up or whatever, you might as well be wrapping my hands for a fight. I completely became somebody else. And I talked my ass off. I always said if you punched me in the face later on, let me know what I said in the gym because I'd have no idea what it was. And, uh, but it's a fun way to train. And God, I like to get myself way over my head. That way you got to dig yourself out. Yeah. If you don't do that, you'll never train hard. You know, you run your mouth and now someone's going to kick your ass and then you're in it then. And that's the way you get strong. We were all strong. And then what happens? I, 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 oh. I want to say, well, that's it. I'll, I'll, I'll bring this up at another time. When you did better than somebody else, would you compete against yourself then? Is that where that came? Of course, I wanted to stay ahead of them. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there, Gary Sanger started to get very, very strong in the 98s. He came up, and I said, Gary, I'll live two times against you in the 98s, and I'm going to move up to 220 because Roger Esep kept kicking my ass and uh, in the 98s. So I, I beat him twice, then I moved up to 220, and then Gary had to compete against Roger. Then I won my first nationals, and Gary got second to Roger Esep. You know, we always had our rivals. People, you know what, in a gym, Tom, uh, people come up and say, why do you help him? Why do you help her? Why do you help him? Because if I don't make my competitors better, why my people will get better? Mm -hmm. You know, you got to have competition. You're not going to get any better. You're going to raise the level of people you're competing That's against. That's right. Iron yeah. sharpens iron. Yes. Then when you have all these guys, you're still in your basement of your house. Uh, there's some pictures that we went through um, that there seemed to, you had adjustable jack stands. Oh, yeah. Well, where, where did the idea, where did the conception, where did that come in? Well, we used our power rack, but in contests, you had adjustable jack stands. There wasn't stuff like monoliths today. Yeah. You know, there were like um, uh, car rims, sometimes filled with concrete, a two inch pipe with a V, mm -hmm. and you, you could raise it up and down, thank God, with a, you know, a pin. And uh, that's what you had in contests. You did, you did what you had, you know. Yeah. And uh, benches were no, there's no standard bench. Sometimes the bench would be real low. Other times you have to put 100-pound plates underneath your feet. So there was no standards back then. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so finally they do have pretty much standards today. Like we, our bench that we sell is a great bench. It's like every other great bench, though. So were you, even back then, always on the lookout for what people were doing, any new pieces of equipment, anything that give you an advantage? Always. Yes, what? I always look for an edge. What was the first big piece of equipment that you got well, and you said holy shit this is going to give us an advantage well actually after i broke my back in 1973 uh and i ran around on crutches for 10 freaking months i came up with the reverse hyper exercise and that absolutely jolted our gym up to like you know like jimmy such tell you he made fun of me he made yeah. fun of me look what the hell he's doing now what is he doing hooking waist his feet well no one makes fun of me now yeah. on the reverse hyper same thing with the belt the second thing was belt squatting I did that, and he said, what the hell are you doing now? You know, it's always like, what are you doing now? I've always been ahead of most people. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a progressive thinker. And uh, all, people say, how do I come up with these machines? Every machine I come up with, I came up with it for a purpose for someone in my gym. Mm -hmm. I have to make them better, you know, and I'm always looking for top people. So uh, you people listen to this podcast, you've got some nuts and some balls. Uh, give me a buzz if you want to come to Westside and, and break world records. You also said at the end of training sessions, you'd sit down with um, Gary. Gary and assess training. Never yes. criticize, assess to yeah, see right. what, uh, how valuable was that and is that It's today? great. You know, I always analyze. I've never criticized. I've been in the same boat everybody else has been. I, I never lifted a weight at one time in my life. No, we would sit down. Like if Matt Demo had a problem, me and Gary would, we'd, well, how can we fix it? If Gary had a problem or I had a problem, Bill Whitaker had a problem, any of us had a problem. We, we, we worked, we thought, how can we, what can we make training better to resolve this problem? And that's what we did. When did the gym move from your basement to the first location? I think it was Briggs. Jeez. Um, oh. Or was it, was it from your basement to the garage and then garage to? Yeah, we went to, from my basement to the garage. And then eventually we just, we had to move out of my garage. I mean, I replaced the floor twice and. You know, we just had to move out of the garage. And Tom, I'll be honest with you, I don't remember dates because in in '91, you know, I about died, and uh, so I really don't remember. Yeah. But we were in several uh, locations. Mm -hmm. um, Briggs Road, yeah, like, uh, yeah, Briggs Road was the main one. I, oh, I know that would be 1986. That's where I first met Chuck Vogelpohl, Amy Weisberger, uh, the Jester Brothers, 
They brought Katie Patterson in, uh, all the guys right there. It was, it was, it was, it was a commercial gym that a guy owed me money in a Suntap bed business. I was never going to get it. I got conned into going to the gym business with him. But uh, I hated the commercial gyms. I can't stand to go in one. But uh, the good thing was I met Chuck and all these people. There was a lot of people walked through the door. And, you know, lo and behold, I mean, it was just strong. They became strong. You know, never lifted the weight. A lot of people criticize me. I've heard this from all kind of guys. How about this? Uh, that I only take good, strong guys. I started Kenny Patterson, Chuck Vogelpohl, George Hobart. All these guys never lifted weights. And I made them all-time world record holders. So how about that? I took uh, A.J. Roberts, 2,400-pound total, like you talk about. 2,850, best list 2,930 when he left in three years. So it doesn't matter. A system is a system. There's no secret to what we do. My days used to be called West Side Secrets. There's no secret. It's a system, and the system works. How many people in your neighborhood did you have as a world record holder? It wasn't there like... And, and, and Tommy, and, uh, and from this location right now, in a 20-mile radius, there's 14 People, males hold world records. I believe it's 20 uh, if you added the women. Mm -hmm. All-time record holders. Four, 14 males, though. You know, including Dave Hoff, who's the greatest power lifter of all time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it just gives you an idea. You know, we, we've had uh, world records. Like this in the squat. 123, 148, 165, 181, 220, 242, 275, and uh, super heavy. All-time world records. What I think people overlook hugely was how strong the women were out of here. Oh. Like, in, mm -hmm. in, uh, around the 90s, we had the strongest women's team in the world. We went to World War in every weight class. So uh, we've always been super strong mm -hmm. with the women. I mean, and then, you know, of course, then later on, Laura Phelps started in, uh, you know, just with the gear, you know, new gear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, technology, the people back in, I believe, are stronger than they are today. Yeah. By a mile. It's just technology. It's, it's gears and all this. So I, you always say, who's the best lifter? You just got to go by time. You know, I've always said Mike Bridges under 200 pounds, um, Eddie Cohen, you know, above that. And they didn't, you know, Mike had just almost no gear. Mm -hmm. Eddie wouldn't use gear very much for some reason. And, uh, and then, um, you know, then Dave Hoff, of course, and um, the kid of Big Iron. I can't Sean think of Frankel? It. Sean Frankel. Mm -hmm. Those are the four greatest lifters I've ever seen. Larry Pacifico was a tremendous competitor because no one could beat those four guys, yeah. period. In the warm-up room, they'd kick your ass, you know. In the warm-up room, they, they beat you by 200 pounds. But you could beat Larry, but no one ever did. And I always felt that was, you know, he, he, had, you know, he, was, he was a gutsy guy. How important was it for you to talk to other lifters and share information? And did anyone ever shut you down from getting information? No. No, back then, you know, there's no cell phones. There's, I made a phone call once, once a month. And so I called Larry about the bench and talked to Bill Sino. Mm -hmm. uh, they taught me how to bench. George Crawford taught me how to squat. I remember George said, however you take a bar out, if you take it out right, you'll squat right. If you take it out wrong, you'll squat wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's when you had to walk the weights out. I talked to Vince and Nello and a lot of guys about the deadlift. I, I mentioned before, I said, Vince, what makes your deadlift go up? He goes, anything. I go, what a fucking asshole. <laughs> but then I realized he's doing what I'm doing. E everything made his deadlift go up. Yeah. Good mornings, rack pulls. He did a lot of bent legged good mornings. So, uh, you know, these are all, these are the guys I grew up with. These are super strong freaking people, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, no, I've never had one person ever turn me down. Not one. And is, is that why you are the way you are today, to where you're so open to everybody to answer questions, that every email that comes in here, we, we type it up for you, you respond to them, you answer all your phone calls. Was it because of that foundation? Well, time that goes way back when I was 14 years old. Um, there's Frazier Ferguson ran um, Parker Rose's weightlifting team here in Columbus, and uh, Jimmy Ben's a friend, my three-time national champion. But a guy, you know, would take me up. He worked at Columbus Dispatch, the newspaper. He'd take me up there, and Frazier would never show me a thing. And we're coming home one day, and all I want to do is bang girls, get in fights. That's all I wanted to do, you know. And where I work, I worked a lot. So when I could get money, I had no money. Yeah. Uh, and he goes, "That guy's an asshole." And I go, "What do you mean?" I know what he's talking. He says, "You're the strongest guy up there," and he doesn't show you one thing. And at 14, I didn't think anything of it. You know, I just, well, who cares? But later on, I realized he was right. He would never show me anything. And I was by far stronger than any of them. I had more potential than any of them. And so to that day, that man made it, uh, every time someone asked, I make sure I, I helped him. Because he never helped me. I used that, his negative, uh, 
uh, basically how he thought of me into a positive how I think of others. I've always, there's no negative in, in my life, none, zero. Mm -hmm. I don't get depressed for two freaking seconds. Um, I'm a fighter. Everything goes on. I'm going to, I'm somehow going to kick something's ass, mm -hmm. you know, or it might be, break me in half, which it has, but I'm not going to give up. And so, but Fraser Ferguson, because of what he did, never show me, is why I've been cursed and show everybody. <laughs> so I can thank Fraser for that. Up wherever the hell you're at, Fraser. <laughs> But that's, uh, that's huge, and I think a lot of people don't understand that aspect of Westside, of how much like you've, and how many people have learned from here and went on to be successful coaches and businesses in their own right. Yeah, that's what I'm most proud of. Yeah. The guys that leave here and made su very successful businesses. Uh, when, so you are you were in your basement, then you went to the garage. Was the, the garage is where Matt Dimmel first came in? Yeah, he started there. Uh, Marcus... Marcus the, Marinelli. Oh, so did these guys, everyone had a purpose in the gym. Was part of their purpose too to bring in training partners always to be there? Like I've heard ridiculous stories. Mm -hmm. uh, Dominic Rotolo told me a story that the whole family went uh, on holidays and he was so worried that he bought four tickets. He bought one ticket to go out with them, one ticket to fly back to squat because he missed the day you were gone. Then he flew back out to the family and then flew back in to get the other training <laughs> session. So where, where did that intensity and tenacity come from to where if you're in, you're in. If you're not, don't come back. Well, that's the way it was back then. And, uh, you know, Chuck Vogel, but he showed up and Chuck started to get good. This is why I know strength means a lot. All you sports teams out there, you know, uh, you know, they always talk about strength and kind of put it to the side. But why you got a $3 million facility for your strength coaches? Because it's important. But Chuck, when Chuck wasn't too strong, he wasn't so bad. When Chuck was strong, he was the biggest asshole you ever saw. And Chuck would come in, and he would say, Lou, and we would always start a half hour at least before anyone show up. And we, I mean, we didn't go to the gym. We trained. Yeah. He's always into his freaking crunchers and lap pull-downs. So I'd have to pull the sled, do revert, whatever. But he'd go, Lou, you got to kick. You got to get his kid. Kick him out. I'm going to cry. He was worse than any wife you've ever seen. Yeah. So I go, well, okay. So, so I did. But you know the funny thing, and the stronger he was, the worse he was. But I have to say that he never told me to kick someone out that shouldn't have been kicked out. They, they were worthless. Mm -hmm. And now, now that's what I lack in this gym. Uh, right now, I think the whole world lacks this. Uh, it, it, you know, it's a life or death situation to me, this stupid ass sport. Yeah. And I don't understand. I talk to guys, they just don't get it. I told one of my guys at breakfast, I said, You're so soft, you're making me soft. And then he quit. That's how soft he was. Softer than Charmin. Yeah, that's right. So, anyhow. This gym has, a gym has to be hardcore, mm -hmm. all right? If it's not, you're not going to get, why the hell are you here? What are you doing? So uh, I expect the most out of everybody, and it seems like right now it's hard to get people to want to do it. I've got, I've got a couple guys, and i got a couple girls. And that's what I got. The rest are just putting but, their time in. Well, it seemed like, too, the gym was the best college education you could have got for everything, from being a strength coach to being a freaking psychologist. You've seen people and then have to try and motivate people. Mm -hmm. And um, if you weren't the strongest, but you, everyone had a purpose. And that was a big thing that, uh, and plus everyone knew how to spot, how to motivate and that, which I think is lost again today. Right. So when you brought in a new member back then, how did that work? So just say someone wanted to come in, just say Marcus Marinelli, his first day, how did you go, okay, this guy's a keeper. We keep him, he's a good, well, you know, watch his attitude for a little bit. But back then, see, I, I had, uh, we, we were very successful because we were very strong. So if I only bring one person at a time. So you got four or five really strong guys. You can, How do you fail? You got four or five coaches versus one athlete. You know, poor coach, you got one coach and 30 athletes. So a lot's going to be tra not translated into the athlete, but it didn't work. It worked, worked just the opposite for us back then. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need now. I mean, Marcus had an attitude. That's why he's got strong style in Cleveland and teaches fighters, you know. He's got the heavyweight champion of the world. There's, there's a reason. If you succeed at one thing, you can succeed at something else. Mm -hmm. If one man can do it, so can you. Don't think just because that guy can do it. You can't because you can. <clears throat> Again, there's going to be a lot of these questions. Are the stories true that when you were working, if you had to work late, that people would come to your house and they'd be in your living room waiting regardless of what time it was. And as soon as you walked in the door, it was training. That's right. No time to change. I always had a strong deadlift 
lockout. <clears throat> and I believe because I come home, I, I wore jeans, I ran cranes. I come home, they'd be waiting. I'd walk right on through the house and go train. You know, right out, and I didn't put nothing on, went out and trained in jeans. Mm -hmm. And I pulled deadlifts up in jeans off boxes. You get a real strong lockout. And one time, um, I was working in Springfield, it's about 40 miles away, and I and I had to do a double shift with the crane. I didn't get home. My buddy Bill Whitaker was going to spot me. I was going to squat. This is at 5. I don't get home to 11. I get home, his car's in the parking lot, my house. I go in, he goes, you ready to squat? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Down the basement we go, and I weighed, I weighed basically about 180, no gear. I squatted 685. Mm -hmm. And he's a tough judge. Yeah. I did this at like midnight. But that's the difference, you know. You just can't, well, I'll do it tomorrow. You no, know, there ain't no tomorrow. There might not be a tomorrow, guys. You might die. Were, were you that driven, even if he wasn't there, you would have done it, or was having a training partner there that actually little bit well, of focus? That's when I realized how important training partners were, you know. Chances are I run a crane from, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning till, you know, it was t like 10 at night. I got out of there at 10, drove back home. He's still there. You know, it's not like today, text someone or call. Yeah. There wasn't no cell phones. I had no cell phone or, no, you know. This is in the 70s. Yeah, it made it, uh, it was grueling, but it was fun. The, when you talk to a lot of the previous members, they said it wasn't getting injured, it wasn't the biggest thing that they, was their nightmare, was missing a lift. Huh. Because if you missed a lift, you better come back and get it because you would make their life a misery talking crap. <laughs> Is that a truth? Yeah, pretty true. <laughs> You know, John Black had a theory, he called it miss and punish. If they missed a lift up a black self world, they'd add weight to the bar. <laughs> I mean, they were, you know, I watched, I went up there one day and I watched him push a guy's head through the, through the wall. Oh, yeah. Jackson Dares, I believe his name was Janet, he puts his head right through the wall. You know, I'm going, you guys are serious. And I said, well, I got to be serious too. If they're serious, I got to be serious. <laughs> When, uh, when did you get your first experience of Black's Health World? Because it seems to be that the two um, clubs were, were pretty much filled of similar mindsets. Yeah, they did. They had a lot of guys, a lot of big, strong guys. Yeah. And uh, I really admired them. I mean, uh, you know, John, John Black and all the guys they had. To this day, I still talk to a few of them. Yeah. Bob Ford kind of run the show. Now, my first experience is in the 70s. I go up there. And I said, it's John Black. Hey, how are you, John? I said, John, John, Lou, will you, will you spot? Never meet me. I said, sure. He had them freaking jack racks that you had to pick up, put the pin in, in and out. And that, that was my first experience, John Black. And I said, what a con man. <laughs> I swear to God. Yeah. Spot the whole station, picking them weights up, moving in and out. Did that make going to powerlifting meets more fun because you see these characters everywhere you Oh, went? yeah. Yeah, I mean, I tell stories in my book about getting kicked out of meets for life. You know, yeah. tearing up gym floors, and I mean, it's crazy. You know, those guys were absolutely crazy. We weren't quite that crazy, we, you know, but they were. Yeah, yeah, they were a bunch of uh, teamsters, and they were also uh, strike breakers, <laughs> and they didn't give a damn, buddy. When did you first meet George Crawford? I met George Crawford the first time, nineteen sixty-six, before I got into the army. Okay. And I see the guys about five foot tall and got legs like tree trunks. I go, holy crap! So then, uh, you know, I talked to him just briefly. And I go, because I watched the squad, he tried the American record. At the time, it was about 5'10 or something, 165s. And, and I get out of the armies, and I go to start going to meets, and there they are, him and Larry Pacifico, Mel McKinney, Vince Anello. And I, start, I asked him questions about squatting, and he told me. Mm -hmm. Now, was, he, was, he was a character. Um, I, you know, um, Dave Waddington, the first 1,000-pound squatter, is in my house. He's telling me a story one time. And he says that, uh, you know, George trained with him up in um, Sandusky, Ohio. And he goes... Uh, so George posted squat. Well, he don't show up. So he shows up like the workout's done. Yeah. George shows up and, and Dave goes, hey, hey, George, what's up, man? Did you squat? And he goes, uh, yeah, I squat. <laughs> he goes, well, where did you squat? And George pauses. He goes, in my head. <laughs> so, so Dave says, well, how was it? And he says, it was a good one. And that was, <laughs> that was George Clark or George Crawford. That was him. I, I would call his house. And it's answered the phone. It goes, George Air. And someone say, no, but I'm his connection to earth. <laughs> I mean, that's, that was George. He yeah. was out there. But that's why he was a world record holder. If you're normal, people only give you normal results. If you're normal, don't even get into anything. Just be normal. You want you got to be abnormal to do abnormal things. That's, that's, that, that's common sense. And, you know, you're talking about psychology. People read psychology books. But the guys I work with, I'm talking severe people and i learned to read people 
instead of read books. I learned yeah. to read books. They taste that. How the hell did I handle them, guys? I remember Mark, Mark Ruggiero one time sees me on the meet. I hadn't seen for five years. I said, what the hell happened to you? And he goes, he tell me a little story. And I go, well, I don't get it. I don't see why you left. And he goes, well, you know, it's a 360-pound jacked-up dude. He goes, well, you know, Lou, you're a hard man. And my reply was, Mike, I have to be a hard man. I'm dealing with people with you like you. <laughs> how am I going? To, how do you deal with people like that? And, you know, people carry guns everywhere they went and everything else. Drug dealers, the whole nine yards. Yeah. So I just worked, learned to deal. And I always ran jobs. Yeah. So I had a lot of people under me all the time. Yeah. So. How important was the first generation of lifters? Because you had, as you said, you had college professors. You had a uh, vet. And you had, uh, yeah. Bill Whittaker's Almost all PhDs. Yeah. Uh, did they help to go, okay, I'm on the right lines, like to where you toss back and forth ideas and then every generation would get better and better and better? Yeah, this was before the Soviet-style training in 1982, you know. Gary was here two years after that. Mm -hmm. But I think he might have been the last one, and Matt Dimmel. And, of course, uh, you know, then Chuck came two years in 1986, mm -hmm. where I finally started to finalize the program that we're doing. Yeah. You know, you just don't get a program set in a year. Yeah. Use a lot of experiments and so forth. And... um yeah, so that's a that's about that's about when it happened. But they, but they set the tone. Those guys. One thing I found out: if you're going to be a PhD or you dig ditches or you're a prison guard, you you got to have the same goal. Mm -hmm. You know, you you got the. I mean, the PhDs they were the hardcore, and you know, they would knock your ass out in a second. Now, I mean, Tom Pelucci was a psychologist and an attorney. He he freaking rip your ears off. You know, the guy was, you know, you you <laughs> didn't want to make him mad. Put it that way. Where did the idea of having breakfast or everyone getting together to eat food from? And why is that still so important to where you get everyone's breakfast and make sure everyone has something here? I think it's a team concept, you know. It's just like a family. You get up, you, have, you know, what's wrong with families today? They don't, have, they don't have dinner at night with each other. Mom and dad, you know, they're not there. The kids are out somewhere, Lord knows mm -hmm. where, doing who knows what. But, I mean, Westside is basically a family. I try to make it a family best I can. As the years gone by, it seems to be losing grip. Mm -hmm. I try to keep that grip. And a lot of people, you know, I look at my craziest people, and they criticize them, but they're my best people. Yeah. And sometimes you got to put up with weird things. I mean, people don't bother me. I'm used to these kind of people, you know, where people are, oh, I'm not looking for model citizens. I'm looking for model powerlifters. Yeah. It's not my business what they do outside of the gym. I don't give a damn. You know, they could kill 43 people if they get away with it as long as they jump the train. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's honest. I mean, I've, you know, really crazy people over the years. Then did you guys, after you trained, did you do stuff together as a group always? And like when you went to powerlifting meets, it was always as a group? Oh, it was always a group. Yeah. I, uh, I tore a tension fashion one time. And uh, as the second time I ever tore it, well, I got acupuncture. And I was... I was, but I wanted to go to meet a month later, and my best squat was 775, you know. And I go, I could box squat and it hurt like hell. And I go, well, don't even, no one even go. You didn't, I didn't need them. There was no gear. Yeah. And uh, so, so what do I do? Everyone went with me. They all went, and I went down squat 760 and made a big total, you know. And, yeah. But they all went. You could not keep them at home. Yeah. Amy Weisberg, you know, would really bug the crap out of me because, <laughs> yeah. and I didn't really want, to want her, a woman around me when I lifted. But you couldn't keep her from going to a meet. Yeah, you know, every freaking meet, there she was. So you know, I give her a lot of credit. Amy still, 1986, she's still here. When did the was she? She was the first female lifter outside of Doris here. No, I had a lot of them. You had a lot. Yeah, Pam, Chris. I had Pam, Chris. We we got to Hawaii, win the worlds. Mm -hmm. Pam wins the world power meet, decides to jump into Miss Bikini, wins Miss Bikini. Yes. At the same time? Same meet. The, yes. The next day, wins Miss Bikini. I had a lot. These girls were yeah. jacked back then, and they were built, and they were good looking, you know? Yep. So we went from your basement to the garage, garage to Briggs. Was that when you started? You didn't like the gym setting, but then that, that gave you access to where you had um, Kenny Patterson, then came in. When did Jerry Obramovich and George Halbert and them start coming in? They started coming in a couple of years later. I actually moved to another bigger gym on on uh, on Denver yes. Road. Yeah. But then I moved into a hundred square foot in a little mall where the windows are blacked out. That's when the gym took off. It's in the ghetto. And that that was one thing you say even to this day that having that tight atmosphere mm. was huge because <laughs> fights would go off and would have been so close. I mean, it was just a. Right. A lot of energy. Everybody's in a bad mood. Everybody. And we bet a lot of money. There's always betting money on, you know, run your mouth. Well, 
let's do it right now, you know. And uh, I mean, I've talked about this before, but I'm on a, Chuck Vogelpohl had a drug addict friend, Tony, and he's claimed he out deadly Esco to Swede train for us for 10 years. I said, no, Chuck, Esco out deadly. He said, no, he didn't. I said, Chuck, I was there. So him and I joined two in a parking lot. He's 270 pounds. I'm, I'm my big ass, 240. Yeah. And he goes, uh, he puts his finger in my face. And he goes, let me tell you something. So we're having a death of a contest. This is Sunday afternoon. We're having a death of a contest tomorrow. And he said, it's you and Chester, John Stafford, him and that Tony, and two South African super heavyweights is there. I says, you're on, motherfucker. So he, here he is, got that finger at my face. Like that. <laughs> so we go in. So a long story short, Esco films the thing. And Esco was scared to death of everybody, but he filmed it. Uh, it was a team. A team. So me and Chester and Chuck and Tony tied. I tore my hand, Chuck tore his hand and his hamstring. Not a word was said, and then just go on from there. That's how it was. Was it true that people from the street would come in just to watch you train? And uh, I've heard stories that they'd even try bet down money of what you guys were doing. Well, a lot of people come in. A lot of cops would come in scared to death because back then we did a lot of illegal <laughs> shit. Cops would come in at night. I'm going, oh my god, oh my god. You know, John John Sayer came in one night in a bad mood. You know, kick everybody's ass in the whole country. National judo coach for seven years, and he, he's talking about ripping somebody's balls off and hanging on their ears. <laughs> the cops are going like, "Who in the hell is this guy?" You know, I mean, he was he was uh, he was jacked up that night. That's the kind of people would have in there. But I heard stories about him and pieces of silver, and oh. that what, what, my you... first plyo swing, my prototype. I told him I'd give it to him. Says okay, so he brings the truck down. Well, first of all, me and this Esco getting a huge fucking fight. And I mean, it was it was bad, and so so then everybody leaves. It's me and John in the parking lot. And we got that thing up in his truck, and he goes, "Well, I want to give you these silver pieces for it." Now you got to remember. Now John's a black belt and everything you can think about, and he's a big he's a big slam of a bitch. I go, John, I want no money. And he goes, "No, you're you know I got to give you silver." I said, "I don't want nothing for this." He gets freaking angry, and he goes, "You need to take his fucking silver." And I'm thinking to myself, "Well, I could take the silver and not get my ass kicked, or." Not take the silver and get my ass kicked. I said, give me the silver. Give me the silver. I don't know why he always gave me silver gold pieces and stuff, but he did. <laughs> I mean, I still got them. I don't know what. But, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget that. Every time, you know, a grappler, every time you come in and grab you got to grab you, got to mess you up. That's just where they are. When did Eskel get here? Esco must have come in the mid-early 90s. He wrote for a magazine in Sweden. Okay. And he came over here because he basically didn't believe that what I said we do, we did. So I watched this train, and I said, Esco, we're going to uh, um, Dallas for a bash for case at John Andrews' place. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so we, we uh, so he goes, well, I'm going to. He gets a ticket, goes down there. Anthony Clark, the king of all benchers, you know, goes down, reverse grip, first 800-pound bench is what he did. So we go down there. He goes with us. Well, Kenny goes down there and breaks world records, and, and then he come back. I go, well, he goes, I, I guess, and won, like, 10, beat Anthony on coefficient. And said, I guess you guys do what you say you do. Yeah. And he moved here for 10 years. I heard a story about him in a bent bar. Oh, yeah. is, is, that, is that story true? That's a true story. <laughs> this is how bad my gym was. Uh, we're going to have the deadlift contest. We called it the Esco Thomas Invitational. Because <laughs> he's just going to kick our freaking ass. You know, Chuck could deadlift the house. And he couldn't out deadlift me. Couldn't even close. So when it finally came up a month later, he is so scared that he can't budge 580. He's going up 650. This is in just in the gym. 650 opener, can't budge 585. So you imagine what we're saying to him. So we get done, and now he unloads the bar, and he's deadlifted with two and a quarter, sitting on a box. And I said, on our deadlift bar, I said, hey, motherfucker, you can't do that. You'll bend that bar. And I went down to Hyper's gym's only 800 square feet. Yeah. And uh, I hear Chuck rip the plates off, you know, rip the plates off the bar, and next thing I know, I hear somebody squealing out the driveway. He left. He got, he, he got so pissed, he left. He lived right down the street about a mile. So I get Chuck's brother, who's huge, and this guy, uh, Sparky, who's in prison all the time. And there, Matt Demo dropped the bar across the box, and it was bent like this. So we load that bar up, and we go to his house, and I beat on his freaking door. And he opens up the door, he's just glaring at me. I said, motherfucker, look what you did. They had that bent bar. <laughs> so he tries to kick me and take a swing at me. <laughs> the funny thing, we went to his house. Harassed him. Went, followed him home and harassed him. That's how Westside used to be. Oh, Nobody Lord. got, you didn't get an inch at Westside, man. That included me, too. How many competitions did you have in the gym? Oh, <laughs> probably at least one a week, if not more. Just, just open your mouth. 
You could sometimes you almost get out the door to end. You had to turn back around and go in. You're having a contest. So th that's true. If you lost that one, another competition would come to someone. Yeah. Chuck, Chuck was a great, Chuck was a winner because he's the worst loser I ever saw. I've never seen a person such a bad loser, but that must made him a winner. Yeah. Yeah. One time me and Joe McCoy beat him and Don Dameron in a squat contest and I went last. Of course, I'm running my mouth and I turn around. He's already loading his deadlift bar up. He goes, we're deadlift now. I said, I don't remember saying about no, no deadlift. Well, we are. Well, we did. You know, of course, he won the deadlift contest. But that, and uh, Sonny, a guy used to work on my race car. You know, Sonny wasn't a lifter, but he lifted. He'd come yeah. in because he worked on my race car. So we let him come in. And Sonny told me floor press so much. Chuck said, there's no way. He said, hell if I did. So I got a bunch of $200. 200 200 so, so Sonny says, you're on, because Sonny was a gamer. Yeah. And so Chuck gets three judges. You know, three guys are going to judge this. I'll be goddamn. Sonny benches the whatever it was, like 310 or something. You know, he wasn't on. But he benches it. So Chuck goes to 200. Chuck paid him in coins. Coins. Took him back two weeks, but he paid him at change. Yeah. Didn't give him one dollar, not one dollar bill, all change, two hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that was that's the kind of stuff that went on. When, when did Dave Tate get here? It had to be in the late eighties. Yeah, Dave didn't wouldn't listen. Did just the opposite of what I told him. Went nowhere like he had been. Finally, come around, did it, and jumped like two hundred pounds in the next year. Yeah, Dave's a great. He's a great training partner. What what made him such an influential training partner? Uh, he ran his mouth all the time, and he constantly cheated. You know, <laughs> he would be on a high box and taking him out off your box, and you know, you name it, tell me lies and get me pissed off with people I wanted to absolutely kill him. When and then he, it, you know, this is in the morning, but the afternoon I realized he made this shit up. You know, it, it, it never really happened. Yeah. And, but he did it again, and I'd fall for it again because I, when I walked in the gym, I was I just became somebody else. You know, I, I changed personalities. And, uh, but he, him and Chuck, I've always said, Chuck was like a ditch digger. You know, you got to go to work, you got to dig so many feet of ditch. Yep. And then, but he made it fun. I mean, between the two, they made it fun. Then I, oh, everybody, Kenny Patterson, Joe McCoy. Joe's 19, is one of the best coaches. I started Joe at 14. Yeah. But he was one of the best technical coaches I've ever had in my gym. At 19 years old, he just had this knack. You know, if you did something, well, you're, you got to do this. You got to, you know, yeah. whew, that was it. So, but a lot of great guys, George Hobart. I remember George said something that I'll never forget. Um, he said that uh, he learned a lot from J.M. Blakely and a lot from Kenny, but they didn't learn anything from him. He also said, if there's a problem, you got a problem in this gym, someone can solve it. And he was right at the time. At that time, he could solve it. Mm -hmm. What happens if you get new people who don't know anything, now you got a bunch of people who don't know anything. Yeah. If they're not going to listen, they're going to go nowhere. And that, that's, it's dry, you know, that stuff drives me crazy, as yeah. you well know. <laughs> <clears throat> then you went from Demarest to where the location is today, but you didn't have the two sides. You started off with one side of the gym. Yeah. Then who was there around that time? So you have around... Dave Tate, Dave Tate and Chuck and the guys. And then when we first started, that's when Dave started Elite Fitness. Yeah. And I, you know, he's almost like a drug dealer. He's on the phone all the time. And I can see that he was ready to pull out, you know. Yeah. And Dave pulled out for business, which, you know, it's fine. I yeah. mean, he's, he's getting beat up then. He's beat up now. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, Dave went on and started Lee Fitness and made a tremendous success of himself. Then when did the, who else do we have? We had from, George Hobbert was still there. Yes. At that time. Was he still producing world records? Oh, yeah. We, I mean, we went to meet Kenny, Rob Fusner, and George broke world records in the same meet. Mm -hmm. That's saying something, you know, in the yeah. bench, in the bench. I, I remember Ryan Canelli, I just, Ryan was here with me about a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, Ryan call, told me one time, he, that me, because I watched Ryan, this is in the early 90s. I watched Ryan put his fingers on the smooth 635 in the warm-up room. And he said, he, he, he told me later what he did, he wanted to psych out West Side guys. Well, he, back in this, you, you, you're lucky to get 100 out of shirt because yeah. he bombed out with 711. And I told him then, I said, dude, there is something wrong with you. I don't know what you're doing, but you need to change. Which he did. Yeah. Became one of the, may, may be the greatest venture of all time. But anyhow, uh, our guys broke three world records in that meeting. It, it was great. And I remember, uh, um, you know, it was, it's happened a, a few times. Dave Waddington, or uh, Waterman, looked like Mr. America Venture. Had a world record 628. This back when the gear wasn't much. Um, so we go down, George cuts down to 198, ends up benching 683. 
He opens up at 633, breaks the world record. Now I remember Water, Waterman says to me, man, I think I got some competition. I said, yeah, I think you do. George walked out of 683, world record over 628 previous. That's what, you know. Yeah. Kind of stuff. I, there's a lot of memories. We went down to Lumberton, uh, North Carolina. You know, not very much money down there. had $8,000. I, I called him. I said, you really got $8,000 for a bench meet? He goes, we sure do. I said, well, have it in small bills. We'll be down to get it. <laughs> So here we go. And of all people, Waterman went down there too. You know, at the time, he was a world record holder. <laughs> well, we, but he bobbed out. He's, he had a, a Kmart bench, a Kmart bar. I mean, the, like JM says, like bench of a three-inch camera bar. He wouldn't use 100-pound plates. It's crazy. But um, anyhow, uh, we won first, second, third, and we took all the money. And I never, I mean, I thought we were going to go get out of that town with our life. <laughs> And a guy called me a month later, you know, and, I, and he's, he said, I can't believe you guys came. I go, dude, you got $8,000? These guys are going to go down there. And that's what that's, that's a, I remember that. I'll never forget that place because they did not like us. I'd imagine a lot of people didn't like you when you're going to meets. Yeah. Well, I tried to not enter teams after that. Yeah. Because it, it, it caused bad feelings. I give a shit. We don't have any trophies. Yeah. What do we care? You know, you ask Chuck or anybody when we go to Chicago or Dallas or wherever we were, Atlanta, whatever, uh, we won. Trophies is underneath the hotel beds when we left. The only trophy that anyone should have is the one that they don't have. That's a very good point. Yes. Can't look back. Satchel Page said if you look back, someone will be gaining on you. <laughs> the adversity you guys had in powerlifting meets compared to people's complaints today i've i've heard of some stories of when you got to a meet that literally they walked in no warm-ups had to take a squat and then there's ones that where you had to rush to a planes are those like uh Absolutely stories true. true oh yeah what was one of the most ridiculous ones that you can think of a couple of things that are the most ridiculous i've ever seen yeah well, one uh, at the meet. Well, one, I, you know, I put this on. I put this on uh, the a Ernie France because we kick our ass. Ernie France, strongest power team in the world. We won our nationals nine, three, four, five, six, and seven. But one year we got here. We were in Chicago in his backyard, and of course, you know, we kicked everybody's ass. And the guy that owned the hotel put the meat on, so he's rushing me and Chuck to the airport. And Chuck still got briefed for him. We we changed the clothes in the guy's car. And we go there. When I get home, I find Tom Waddle, who's a big, mean character in our gym. <laughs> and so Ernie France goes, and in second place, Westside Barbell. So Ernie's like tall, smaller than me, you know. So, they, or, uh, you know, um, what's his name goes Tom up Waddle. there. Yeah, Tom. And he goes, what the fuck are you talking about? We won. And Ernie about had a heart attack and said, well, you know, I was just joking, you know. Yeah, <laughs> joking my ass. Tom, thank God for Tom. And then um, Greg Penora. I mean, Greg Penor was just straight up strong. And we're in New York at the WPL semis. And here he comes, as usual, late. There's 750 pounds on the warm-up bars. Hey, uh, where are you at? I go, dude, there's, it's time to go out there. It's 750 pounds. So we put 200s on a bar, and he squats that, and he goes out on the platform with 1,003, all-time record, and did it. Yeah. That's it. That's Some amazing. of the amazing things I saw. I also watched him. He squatted 1060. He took the bar out, lost his balance, goes all the way down. We grabbed the bar inches from the ground, pick it back up with him, put it in the rack, and he turns around and he looks at me and goes, uh, everybody okay? I go, yeah, because I want to take out again. I go, you, uh, like when? He goes, now. <laughs> he took it back out and squatted the thing. It's amazing. It's amazing. And Incredible strength and potential. He broke the world total record like seven times. Yeah. You said uh, he had a, a grinding gear that no one else had. Oh, uh, yeah. He's just stupid strong. He's good in all three lifts. Too. Yeah. Like, On meets, there's one. Is it true that you got banned from Zanesville plus life? <laughs> plus 10 years. Plus 10 years. <laughs> Yeah, a guy said something to me. Uh, my, my, I had a broken back. Yeah. This, I know this is 1981. My, I had a fracture in my lower back, and it kills, killing my knees. And but I, I go out and squat, and I, I wanted to. Clean, they wouldn't put carpet down, and I squat wide. Yeah. And, and I said, "Well, you got to clean that, that off." So, uh, so then I wrap up and I go out there, and my back, you know, it's just killing me. My knees are killing me. So I said, I, "I'm passing." This world, I was taking a world record, and the guy at the desk said, "You mean after all that, he's not taking that weight?" My friend Randy Camage, um, he gets pissed and he's ready to go fucking punch his ass. I said, "Don't worry about Randy. Don't worry about it. Randy's a big, 
muscular, you know, kick-ass kind of person. Yeah. So then in the bench, a bench comes around. I go out there, and like I said, they didn't have standards. So I needed 100-pound plates on my feet. So I asked him for, and the guy says on the microphone, what's he complaining about now? <laughs> I jumped off the bench and took off after him. And I got right to him, and I swung at him, and, his, and Vault Randy grabs me around the waist. I hit this freaking like a school lunch table yeah. or for everybody there. The table breaks. Drinks go everywhere. Everything goes everywhere. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know, but it was all police. <laughs> it's all police so they they finally grab me and they get me calmed down and i'm a midget compared to who i brought this to me yeah. and they go they go uh you're banned from zanesville and i said uh, what I, I said fuck you i'll own zanesville <laughs> and uh but they, they banned me for life you know but i got to go back a few oh, years later that was pretty fun but i didn't know they were cops until until <laughs> i'd done that <laughs> Well, it seems back then it didn't matter if you were a power lifter, it was the universal. Everyone was just a lifter back then. Yeah. Uh, so jumping back to when you had Greg, when did um, Matt Winning enter the situation here? Was he I'm, before or during or after when Greg and all them? I think it was before Greg showed up, you know? Yeah, yeah Matt let, Matt made uh, I me. Mean, I, I remember, you know, you talk about people asking about isometrics. We did functional, but... Uh, you know, um, he showed up here and we go to the first meeting, can't deadlift 600. Yeah. So the next meeting, he deadlifts 600. Well, that, yeah, that's not going to cut it. So he had him pull from the floor. Uh, he couldn't get the weights off the ground, up to pin one, and then set it down, pull it up, you know, like triples or fives, if I call them, like me, or three or five sets of five. Mm -hmm. And anyhow, a couple years later, he's pulling 800 pound deadlift. Matt was, I mean, or, you know, um, he was very, very strong. Yeah. Matt Wenning was very strong. Then he, you know, he left. Um, and then to start up, you know, he's very successful too, working with the armed forces. Yeah. I just saw him the other day. I don't know if I told you. No. Yep. I nailed his ass in the restaurant. <laughs> um, it's amazing the people who have been through these doors. Yeah. Like it's amazing like what they've gone on to do and what lifts they've achieved and what lifts they left behind them. Oh. But there's one thing, Lou, that you always said. I don't think people understand. Your best days always turn out to be your worst days. Yeah. And if it wasn't for your worst days, we wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here, no one would be here, the books wouldn't be there. But can you explain to where, like how, anytime you got near success, something always... Well, I remember back in 73, I make 1655 totals, the biggest total. And I come back to Lee, Ohio, by myself, mm -hmm. need nobody. And I said, my back is indestructible. It literally felt like I had cables in my low back. I just missed the 700 deadlift. And it says, 1E1, 2R win, you know. And... Uh, well, about a month or two later, I break my lower back. They're bent over good mornings at Ohio State. They hauled me home, dumped me on my floor, and I laid on my floor for three days peeing in a coffee can. I couldn't even get on the couch. It uh, separated my SI joint and broke my uh, L4 and, and L, L3 and L5 and L4 vertebrae. And I mean, I was bad. It took ten, I was on crutches for 10 months. And so that's that's the start. But I, not one day I would, I would go down on my crutches, down in my basement, look in that mirror, and say, you know, when am I going to get better? When am I, uh, I mean, I never, not even considered ever quitting. And then uh, in 1979, <clears throat> senior nationals, no one could beat Larry Pacifico. And they were talking about who could beat who. I said, I could beat, I could beat. <laughs> I told the guys. So I go out, but I I open up a 672, an easy deadlift, but it's called Meltdown in Mississippi. Anyone that was around back then. It was so humid, 97 degrees. Brother Bennett, the ADFPA president, had no mm -hmm. air conditioning in Mississippi. The bar was like ice. Ricky Crane stands up. He's very theatrical. Ricky stands up and looking at his hands. The bar's still on the ground. I'm going, what the hell, Rick? Rick goes like, he's looking at his hands like, oh, well, come on, Rick. Well, I found out. I pulled 672, locked the thing out. But they, it was slipping a little bit. Instead of giving me a down signal, it ended up tearing my bicep off. So uh, that deadlift locked up second place. No one ever would have succeeded that. Mm -hmm. I'd have got second to Larry, but I went, I went home with nothing. And then I'm in the gym one time. I, I, I tore my patella a little bit in 1985 at work. It's 1991. Take a weight. I said, uh, Chuck, I may take a weight. I took 685 with a low hassock. sock. Mm -hmm. With no, just me, no spotters, no nothing. Did that strong. So I said, I want to take 735 for a record. So come over and spot me. I take it out and I stumble, put the bar back in, took it out. Right at the, right two thirds up, boom, I blew my patella in half. Sounds like breaking a broomstick. So I break a record in five minutes. No, this is five minutes. I didn't say that. So guys pissed me off. I was done, but the 
taught me to take another one, me and Chuck. I got really pissed. And I already forgot that it hurt my knee. I felt my knee tear on that. And uh, I, I blew my kneecap off. Break your all-time record, tear my kneecap off. And it was really good. I honestly did because two weeks later, I was going to senior nights in Pittsburgh. Yeah. So if I'd gone over there, there was no monoliths. There was no safety straps. I'd have probably really got hurt. You know, so as bad as it was, it's better than what, it, you know. So those are the kind of days, you know, that I've is always it, had. Is it true when that happened that a few minutes after or whenever they came in, your blood pressure was perfect and you're already planning how to come back? 110 over, 110 over 70. Yeah, just I said, I told, yeah, I said, Chuck, I brought my knee. I said, I'm thinking, how am I going, how long is this going to take? How long is this going to take? And then 14 weeks later, he tried to kill me in surgery. Literally, just about, just about got me. There's a, there's one word here that you hate to hear and you don't believe in, and that's can't. And that's a, that's a big thing, which is since you started, that's just not, and even to this day, and I know we've got, uh, you've got your book coming out, which is going through the, everything from West Side, but to where I don't people I don't think they understand your work ethic now to where we're we're always five days behind you. You always want to have this, this, this because there's always there's so much you gotta do. What do you think is it just because the way you are or what drives you today? Like what what is your driving factor? Well, because I I can't live no more. I, I you know, I've got guys uh, like, you know, Jeremy Smith and mm -hmm. I got Wes McCormick and I got Heidi Howard, you know, I've got these girls and Shanae, I mm -hmm. think Shanae will get up to eight hundred pounds squat, a female. Uh, that's what drives me. If there's one per I would keep the gym open for one person. Yep. One person. That's all I need. Because I, it's like, you know, they say if you get down three times, you, you drown. You know me? Fuck that. I'll get down four or five times, and I'll think I'll still survive. So I just, I'm just always looking for, you know, more success. To finish on this, is the story true about your buddies bringing you down to the hilltops to get into fights, and you picked a fight <laughs> with a big dude and you just kept getting up? Well, well, no, they would take me down when I was 12 years old, and I get in a lot of fights. I won most of those fights. Yeah. But uh, my uh, my brother-in-law, you know, turned out to be my brother-in-law years later. He got in a fight with, with my my neighbors, and we were all friends. Yeah. And he is so he uh, so my neighbor. Uh, I'm 12 years old, and but the neighbor is a high school senior. He weighed 190, he's six foot. So he hits my brother-in-law, so I hit him, and uh, you know, I didn't do him a lot of good. <laughs> he stands up and he lays me out. And I remember I'm getting up, and he gets, I heard him say, "Don't get, don't get up, don't get back up." Well, I did, and then that was it. And he, <laughs> but I, I knew back then, it, without even thinking, I don't know to stay down. I have to get back up. Yeah. You know, so I, that's what I say. I'm always looking. I'm always looking to improve something or somebody. That's what I'm supposed to be here for. You know. I'm, All right, Lou. Well, uh, I, I've always said to master kung fu, the training must be severe. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you, Tom.